Every day we are blessed by God, and there are certain days when God just gives us an extra dose of his blessing. And he gave us an extra dose in Jeff this morning. Jeff, thank you so much for your testimony. For those who didn't know your story, some of your story. That's why we need to be in prayer for those who are incarcerated and celebrate the ministry that's done in prisons and jails because a chaplain in the Livingston County Jail led Jeff to the Lord and baptized him in the jail. And we are so blessed that his ministry comes to us now. It is Advent. Anybody miss that? It is, it is Advent. Um, and so we're talking about some of the events and circumstances, places and people around the coming of Christ that first Christmas. And so I'm going to invite you to take the word, let's take a walk in the word this morning at two passages that are very familiar to us. Two passages very familiar to us. We're going to start with the prophet Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. Give everybody a chance to find it, though many of these verses you may know by heart between these two passages this morning. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, I'm going to invite you to share this with me. Let's hear, see, and say God's word together this morning. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. Friends, let's share together the word that God gave the prophet Isaiah to share with God's people. Please join me. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. And just go back further in the Old Testament and come to the prophet Micah. One of the 12 minor prophets called minor prophets, nothing minor about their message. Let's look at Micah 5, 1 through 5a. Everyone chance to find it? Micah 5, 1 through 5a. Hear now the word of God as it comes to us from the pen of the prophet Micah. Marshal your troops, O city of troops, for a siege is laid against us. They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come one for me, one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. Therefore Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor gives birth and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord and the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be their peace." We're going to walk through this passage from Micah this morning. So you want to keep your finger there, and we're going to do some other walking through the word as well. Please join with me as we pray this morning. Heavenly Father, as we come to your word, passages that are familiar to us if we've been raised in the church, new to those who may not have been raised in the church, but your word to all of us. And Lord, don't let our familiarity with these passages Take and blind us to the powerful truths you'd have us know because familiarity can breed contempt. We are familiar with these passages and, and most of us through this season, every year go through this season, hear these songs, read these words. Lord, speak to your children new today. Remind us, refresh your word for us and give it the power and the strength that you intend it to have and the hearts and minds of your people. For we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. I've always loved Christmas carols. Am I the only one here? 
Anybody else like Christmas carols? I love Christmas carols. You notice how much we learn about our theology, our beliefs through hymns and carols. Now, I want to very briefly start our time with a quiz. And I know you all love the quizzes that I periodically give you. Um, and so you're going to have a good time with this quiz. Uh, here's what I'm going to do. It's a little brain teaser. And I will give you an alternate title for a Christmas carol, and you tell me what the carol's actual title is. Okay? So that's how our little quiz will go. And just, you know, about seven of them will go through, and let's see how we do on identifying Christmas carols. So here's the first one that you need to get. Give attention to the melodious celestial beings. Hark the herald angels. There you go. That's the idea. Embellish. The hallways, entryways. All right. Nocturnal noiselessness. Silent night. You are so good. Leave and broadcast from a high elevation. Go tell it on the mountains. Okay. Jubilation to the entire terrestrial orb. Joy to the world. Aren't my titles better? Come on. Let's try this one. The apartment of two psychiatrists. <laughs> the, two, the two wise men leaving one behind. Is it the apartment of two psychiatrists? All right, Zach, tell them. Nutcracker sweet. All right. All right. Don't throw things. <laughs> and our last one on our quiz, alas, diminutive settlement in Israel. <laughs> the old town of Bethlehem. You, you, six out of seven, that's not too bad. You missed the easiest one, though. You know? <laughs> this morning, we're going to focus on the little town of Bethlehem. What's so big about the little town? We're going to talk about that this place of Jesus' birth. What is so special about Bethlehem? And as our friends in real estate will tell us, there are three priorities, right? They are location, location, location. Obviously, there's something important about the location of the birth of Jesus. And that's what we're going to talk about. We're going to start with a prophet's perspective this morning. We're going to talk a little bit about Micah. What we know. The Old Testament, filled with pictures, filled with prophecies, predictions of Christ. Prophecies are so precise that we can have complete confidence Jesus is who he claimed to be, and we can, because of the precision of the prophecies, we can take and know God's word is trustworthy. We can trust his word. Now, the prophet Micah. He recorded a prophecy 700 years before Jesus was born. 700 years before the birth of the Lord. You know, and before we get into the passage, let's, let's look at the scene when Micah's writing. Right? Minor prophet, major message. His name means who is like Yahweh. Micah's name means who is like Yahweh. And he ministered in the 8th century B.C., Northern Kingdom of Israel, Southern Kingdom of Judah, both were economic powerhouses at the time, were, were flush with resources, material money. Both nations were doing well, so they'd risen to the heights of economic influence, and at the same time, they had plunged to the depths of moral and ethical decay. Hmm. Well to do with finances well-to-do with things, economically well, and yet the more they seem to do well with things and money, the further they plunge into the depths of moral decay. Sound like a country you know? Possibly, possibly, maybe. Yeah. So, Micah's message, given in the context of the impending invasion of the Assyrians of the northern kingdom. There is this massive world power sitting to the east of them, ready to invade, and he is given this prophecy in the midst of that 
impending disaster, and Assyria did invade. Assyria destroyed the northern kingdom of Israel in 721 BC, destroyed it utterly, completely, took the ten tribes of the northern kingdom into exile and slavery. Yeah, it was in the shadow of that coming apocalypse on that nation. Micah told the Israelites they were going to have their nation destroyed because of their sinfulness. It's because of their sins that the kingdom would be destroyed. And the message applied to the southern kingdom of Judah too, which 135 years later was utterly destroyed by the Babylonians. And the folks there carried off into the Babylonian and exile. And so Micah's message spoke at that moment to the northern kingdom and certainly was a forewarning for the southern kingdom. And we look in chapter 5 of Micah, verse 1 actually should be with chapter 4. It's, it's actually a continuation of chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. It describes the agony and the defilement coming, the captivity, the defeat, the call to arms to try to save their city. I'm going to look at verse 2, because verse 2 we're going to divide into three sections this morning. Verse 2, three sections, so we can understand Micah's message a bit better. The first part is a prophetic preview. We're going to look at a prophetic preview. Micah ministered, now get this, during the reign of four kings in Israel, three kings in Judah. My guess is that the prophet probably wondered in the short time of his ministry if there was ever going to be a monarch who actually could go the distance and stay in office for a period of time. Four kings in one country, three kings in the other. You know, would there ever be a kingdom that would last? You know, so this humble prophet that God sent a prophecy of the birthplace of a ruler whose kingdom would last forever, whose kingdom would see no end. So look at Micah 5, verse 2. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. The verse begins with what words? But you, but you. Micah's setting up a contrast then. He's going to contrast the de coming defeat in Israel, the coming defeat of that nation with the coming victory in Bethlehem. So he tells what's going to be coming from this place, the defeat and the destruction, and then he says, but you, Bethlehem, something else is coming for you. So he sets up this contrast between these two. So, so while big things are going to happen in Jerusalem, much bigger things are going to happen in little Bethlehem. Bethlehem. Now, Ephrathah. How many of you, when we read that passage every Christmas, it's triple Ephrathah. What in the world is an Ephrathah? Ephrathah is the ancient name of the town of Bethlehem. It is the ancient name, and it is used to identify Bethlehem of the birth of Christ with other communities that have the same name. You know, there are other Rochesters in the United States, a lot of other Rochesters in the United States. When I was a little child, my grandparents sent me a birthday card from North Carolina, and it just, you know, to David Smith, Ridgeway Avenue, Rochester, and about Three months later, I got the card, and it had all kinds of postmarks on it. They went to Rochester, Pennsylvania, Rochester, New Hampshire, you know, and someone finally was it in Rochester, not Ohio, but about the third or fourth place, somebody wrote on there, try New York. <laughs> <laughs> and so other Bethlehems at this time in Israel and Judah. And so this was to identify, Ephrathah is kind of interesting because the name, the word means, you know, full of fruitfulness, that of fruitfulness. And so that is the identity of this town, Bethlehem. Bethlehem means house of bread, house of bread in Hebrew. So its ancient name meant, you know, fruitfulness and fullness of fruitfulness, bearing that which is good, and its current name, 
house of bread. So I see four parallels in, with this little town and the baby who was born there, and they are all in your, your study guide page if you want to follow those as well. And, you know, first, Rachel gave birth to Benjamin in Bethlehem. And before Rachel died, she called the name of her son Ben-Onai. Ben-Onai means son of sorrow. Well, dad had a different idea. Jacob called his son Benjamin, which means son of the right hand. And so that's sort of the name that stuck, you know, Benjamin. And, and when we look at that, Jesus is truly the man of sorrows, and he is truly the strong right hand of the father. And so these names that they were playing with with Benjamin in Bethlehem apply to Jesus. Second, Boaz redeemed Ruth from her poverty in Bethlehem. Jesus is our redeemer, and he redeems us from our sins and our, our, our lostness. Third, King David was born in Bethlehem, and our king of kings, you know, who counted David in his genealogy, is born in Bethlehem's barn. Fourth, as I said, Bethlehem means house of bread. And Jesus, what did Jesus say about bread concerning himself? I am the bread of life. I am the bread of life. So there's the parallel there. It's a fitting name for the one who's the bread of life. Bethlehem was small. Bethlehem was small. As a matter of fact, in the clans of Judah, how did they determine cities and jurisdictions back then? Each tribe was divided into thousands. And the places that were too small to number a thousand people weren't counted at all. Bethlehem was so small. It was not, this town was not counted as a viable possession of Judah. It just was not viable. In the census conducted under Joshua, Bethlehem is omitted altogether, not even referenced. So when we talk about little town of Bethlehem, we are talking about something that's not even a fly speck on the paper. This is, I mean, this is not even a wide place in the road with a flashing yield light, right? This is, this is so far off the beaten path. And so Bethlehem, Bethlehem, the last place you look for a mighty king, unless, of course, the king happened to be a descendant of King David, who came from the fly speck community. Now, the next element that stands out, I think, in verse 2, there's a promised program. Out of you will come one who will be ruler over Israel. That's the plan. That's the program. Out of you will come one who will be ruler over Israel. Bethlehem was too small to be included with the shakers and the movers of Judah. Yet out of her would come forth one who would be a ruler. And the phrase in that verse, for me... Remember, this is God speaking, not Micah. For me includes the idea in the Hebrew of me. So this one will not only come for me, this one is coming of me. We need to understand that. It's always translated for me, but it carries the idea of of me. That the coming ruler would come from God himself and of God himself. And that is the mystery of the incarnation, is it not? You know, that is the, the mystery of the incarnation. God the Father would send God the Son to become a human being. And there are four things that were accomplished when Jesus was born. First, God was revealed. God was revealed. You know, up until that time, we're told in the Old Testament, um, what happened if you looked on the face of God? You die. No one could look on the face of God. Could people look on the face of Jesus? They sure could. God was revealed in a way God had never been known before when we come to this program that's being initiated here, this, this incarnation. God was incomprehensible, this great unknown, until Jesus made God known. Now, next thing that's, that I would see is that we were exposed. We were exposed. Exposed how? Well, you know, we were seen for what we are. He reveals our hearts. Jesus reveals our hearts. 
you know, so we see how far short we fall. We see how sinful we are. You know, and, you know, friends, we're not to measure ourselves beside or against one another. You know, well, the person in the next office, in the next cubicle, in the next room, and how am I doing with the person who's going to get the, a promotion or not? We are not ever, as Christians, called to measure ourselves against one another. There's only one standard that you and I are to measure ourselves by, and that is what? The life of the Lord. Are you growing into maturity in the form of Christ? That's our yardstick that we're to use, you know, and to strive to achieve lives that live like the Lord. 1 Corinthians 4, 5 says, He'll bring to light what's hidden in darkness and expose the motives of heart, hearts of men. So when Jesus comes, we're exposed. You know, no matter how much we try to conceal what we're about, we're exposed. Third, Jesus came as a sacrifice for our sins, for our salvation. That's accomplished with this remarkable event in Bethlehem. It wasn't possible for our sins to be removed through the animal sacrificial system in the Old Testament, right? And so, you know, how many hundreds of thousands of goats, and rams, and bulls, and lambs, and turtle doves were slain at the altar in the temple? And all the blood that flowed from all of those animals could never remove the sinfulness of mankind, could never find forgiveness for us. You know, I, I love, that's why we don't in a Reformed church have an altar. Altars in the Bible are used for one purpose, to slay animals. And until you start bringing in the cattle and the goats in here, we aren't doing an altar act here. We have, we have the Lord's table. Because that's where we encounter our sacrifice, is at the Lord's table. And so, so we learn that here, that Jesus is the sacrifice for our sins. He, he did what no animal could do. You know, the sacrifices of the Old Testament foreshadowed the sacrifice Christ would make when he came on the cross. So it was a foreshadow. Hebrews 9.26 tells us, but now he's appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrificing of himself. So that's accomplished with this incarnation. Jesus came to Bethlehem's cradle so he could go to Calvary's cross. It's that simple. In one sentence, he's literally born to die. The fourth thing I'd suggest we see is the promise program announced by Micah. One who will be ruler over Israel. Now that is still waiting to be fulfilled. That is a prophecy yet to be fulfilled. That is coming. This has to do with the second coming of the Lord. Luke 1, 32. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He'll reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. That is yet the promise that's going to be fulfilled. The prophet Micah concludes his prediction of the birthplace by focusing on the third element, he's a profound person. It's a profound person. Are you enjoying my alliteration? I, I hope you've I, I've had to struggle with some of them. But We see this in the last part of verse 2, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. From ancient times is not a good translation. The Hebrew, the phrase means from the days of eternity. From, you know, from ancient times, still has a calendar, ancient times. From days of eternity, loses the calendar, doesn't it? Loses the calendar. And so he comes from the days of eternity. So Mike is expecting this profound person, a supernatural figure who will be physically born in Bethlehem, but who has actually existed through all the days of eternity. You know, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. In verse 14, John 1, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld the glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father. And so from eternity, Jesus is with God, and Jesus is God. From days of eternity, and so he's coming into this human form, the second person of the Trinity, he's always been. You know, when we look at Christ, you know, he's always been, for he is God. He is God. 
You know, and Jesus made that clear himself in John 8, 58. Jesus said, I tell you the truth before Abraham was born, I am. I tell you the truth before Abraham was born, I am. I love how Isaiah 9, 6 describes Jesus. You read it. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. The government shall be on his shoulders. He'll be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. But before we fast forward 700 years to the events surrounding the birth of Jesus, I want to point out a few things from Micah 5, 3, and 3 through 5. We want to look at those verses. First, in verse 3, there's a reference to Jesus' birth. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor gives birth. Second, he'll be a shepherd to his flock. In verse 4, he'll stand and shepherd his flock. How is Jesus understood? He's the good shepherd. He's the good shepherd who tenderly cares for his sheep, the ones who will often go astray, such as his flock in the church. You know, that he cares for the flock, every one of them. He's the good shepherd. You know, in, verse, in John 10, 11, you know this verse, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd does what for the sheep? Lays down his life for the sheep. He lays down his life for the sheep. And Micah references he's going to be the shepherd. Third, he'll bring peace. Look at verse 5. He will be their peace. Jesus came to bring peace between God and mankind and to bring each of us an inner peace that the world cannot give and cannot take away. If the peace of God is in your heart and spirit, the world can't take it from you. The world can't take it from you. Isaiah 9, 6 simply says, He is the Prince of Peace, which brings us to a promising prophecy. So we come to another small village, little known or respected. Bethlehem we know, but there's another small village little known or respected, Nazareth, Nazareth. Now Nazareth is kind of interesting because in Jesus' ministry, one of the challenges he's confronted with is what? Where he's challenged with you know, nothing good can come from Nazareth. Nothing good can come from that place. Nazareth, a woman's pregnant. Her fiancé is trying to figure out how it happened. He's not quite certain about this. Takes two angel visits to straighten it out, one to her, one to him. It was important he got that visitation from Gabriel. Now, Nazareth, 70 to 80 miles north of Bethlehem. Like driving to Buffalo, right? No problem. Hop in the car, off we go. Get there in an hour, hour and a half, not a problem. It's a problem if you're going to walk 80 miles, isn't it? It's a problem if you're going to walk, and particularly when you get out of Galilee, which is the breadbasket of Israel, which is fertile plains and, and fields, and you get into Judah or Judea, and you get there and it is rocky and mountainous and nasty, and it is dangerous. It is very dangerous to go in the area because of thieves who live there and prey upon people on the roads. So they've got an 80-mile walk. You know, and so for, for Micah's prophecy to be fulfilled, nine months pregnant, Mary has to somehow get from Nazareth to Bethlehem. So why in the world would she have any reason to make this trip? Why would she go? Why would it you know, be something that she needs to do? As a matter of fact, Joseph could have made the trip to Bethlehem registered for the census without his wife coming. She could have stayed in Nazareth. He would have gotten back and the baby would have been born. A little town of Nazareth we'd be singing this morning, right? No, we wouldn't be. That's not the prophecy. That's not the prophecy. Luke Chapter 2, verse 1, in those days Caesar Augustus issued a decree that what? A census should be taken of the entire Roman world. In verse 3, we're told by Luke that everyone had to go to his family's hometown to register. Verses 4 through 6 fill in the details. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth, which by the, I think it's interesting, by the way, when he says went up, 
look at the directions, the ups and the downs in the scripture. Because Nazareth is north of Bethlehem, we would say, looking at a map, he went down. This is talking about elevation. Elevation. He's going from the, the flat plains up into the rugged mountains of Judea. So he went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem in the town of David because he belonged to the house in the line of David. He went there to register with Mary who was pledged to be married to him expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn a son. Familiar scriptures. Fulfillment of prophecy. Every piece of it, fulfillment of prophecy. Jesus is born in Bethlehem. Matthew 2 tells us that astrologers came from the east, came to Jerusalem following a star. They went to Jerusalem. They'd gotten to Israel. They'd gotten that far, and they were looking for the one who's born king of the Jews. They had followed the star. Now they needed more specific directions. They didn't have their GPS to work with on the camels. You know, it, was not, it wasn't working. And so we're looking for the king, born of king of the Jews. Their capital is Jerusalem. That's where the king's palace is. Maybe that's where we go to look for him, right? So they go to Jerusalem, to the palace, and they say, where is the one who's been born king of the Jews? And they ask us of the man who happens to be the king of the Jews, Herod. How was Herod feeling about this? <laughs> this was not a welcome visitation on his doorstep, right? You know, he's less than thrilled that someone's been born to take his job. So, so anyway, he calls together chief priests, scribes, all of his experts in Jewish law, you know, and, you know, he says, he has one question, where is the Christ supposed to be born? The Christ. The Christ. The Messiah. What does he understand already about this baby? This is not just going to be a pretender to his throne. And if you're looking in Matthew, take note. The priests, the scribes, the experts on the law and the scripture don't have to take and go and search the records. They don't even have to have a discussion. What they immediately answer is, in Bethlehem and Judea. You know, for this is what the prophet has written, but you, Bethlehem, and the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for out of you will come a ruler who will be a shepherd to my people Israel. They knew. Herod knew. They knew who this was and the implications of his birth. Micah's prophecy 700 years ago, they knew. Herod and his men. They knew Micah 5.2 was referencing this birth, the Savior, the Messiah. So do you grasp just how remarkable this all is? I mean, how for all these pieces to fit together to make this picture, you know, an almost forgotten man named Micah moved in the Holy Spirit to record a prophecy from God which said the Messiah of the children of Israel would be born in the town of Bethlehem 700 years go by. 700 years, by the way, God doesn't measure time the way we do, does he? No. 700 years go by till one day God explodes into human history in a way that if you knew God's word, you'd expect. Sends his son to be carried in the womb of a woman, to be born as a man, God moves the heart of a pagan Roman emperor. Get that. A pagan Roman emperor who lives 1,500 miles away from Israel. God moves his heart. Because God, okay, I've got to get Mary down to Bethlehem. How am I going to do? Oh, we'll just get Caesar Augustus to take and, and pull off the census. And that's going to force them to go to Bethlehem, right? God pulls that off using this pagan emperor to do it. You know, and so... They had to go to their ancestral hometown. Joseph is from the family of David. He had to go to Bethlehem. This is how precisely God orchestrated everything the first Christmas. God made sure that Joseph and Mary were in just the right place at just the right time. He saw to it. Micah writes about the place. 
Now, I'm a firm believer that God puts each of us in just the right place at just the right time so we'll come face to face with him. That we will come face to face with this explosion of the incarnation of God in our lives. That he comes to us. He comes to us. Not just to the little town of Bethlehem 2,000 years ago. God with us, Emmanuel. He is with us. So friends, it's not an accident that you're here this morning. It's not an accident. God has put you in this place at this time to hear a message about Micah. To hear the affirmation that God's word is true. His prophecies are fulfilled. That his plan is being worked out in human history, in his creation. You know, and so you are here. Now, the goal is to believe in the baby born in Bethlehem, that we would believe on this Christ, this Messiah. You know, now, you, maybe you know the right answers to the questions. Maybe you got six out of seven right on the carols. Herod's experts had the right answers, too. They had the right answers, they just didn't have the right place spiritually. Their hearts weren't right. So that raises the question, you know, wise men, wise women still seek him. They still seek him. So are you ready right now to take the next step in your spiritual journey? Are you ready to take the next step in your spiritual journey? The Bible tells us that angels have a party whenever someone receives Christ as Savior. The angels party down and have a good time. And, you know, I picture angels eating Christmas cookies and singing Christmas carols when someone receives the Lord at this time of year, right? Luke 15, 10 says, There's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So I ask you today, do you want to give God's angels a cause to sing this season? Do you want to give God's angels a cause to sing this season? If you don't know the Lord, it's time to make the acquaintance. If you do know the Lord, it's time to renew that acquaintance and make sure it's fresh and vital and real in your life. Give the angels cause to sing this season. That's what I'm inviting you to do. Let go of yesterday and whatever shame and sin is there. Put your faith in Jesus today. It's about today and tomorrow, not yesterday. When you find your place in this world, you find it when Jesus finds his place in your world. That's the important thing. You're in the right place at the right time. Is your heart in the right place? Let's share a prayer. Heavenly Father, as we come to you this day, we acknowledge the extraordinary truth of your word and fulfillment of your promise. Lord, we come, we're humbled that you would call us your own, number us as your children. And yes, Lord, we so want to have our hearts in the right place. Lord, receive from us now the praise due a holy God. As we come into your presence, Lord, we share your word. Your word can speak to your people. Your word will speak to your people. If we come with eyes of faith, hearts that long to know you. Lord, in this room today, there are those who don't know you, those who may know you as Herod and his friends did, simply as a name, a word, but not as Lord and Savior. We pray you would speak to each one in that place today, here in this place that they might come to faith in you and at this hour, this moment, know the power of your presence and the gift of forgiveness and new life. And for all of us who had made that commitment some time ago, we renew that commitment. As we turn our faces toward Bethlehem and see the confirmation once again of the, the promise you made to everyone sitting in this room today. We love you, Lord. We praise you. And we offer ourselves, our hearts to you. For you are Messiah, our Savior. It is in Christ's name we pray, amen.